sectors by raising the VAT threshold, delivering tax reliefs for the creative industries and investing in high-growth industries such as advanced manufacturing. This is in stark contrast to the Welsh Labour Government's anti-business agenda, with Wales having some of the highest business rates in the whole of the United Kingdom. I'm interested that the Honourable Lady Opposite thinks that having the highest business rates in the United Kingdom is funny. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Sadly, pubs and restaurants in Wales are closing at a faster rate yeah, yeah, than in yeah. any other part of the UK. While the measures in the budget, which the Secretary of State mentioned, will bring some relief, does my reputable friend agree with me that the thing that is pushing many of these businesses to the wall right now is Welsh Labour's slashing of business rate support? Yeah. Yeah. So Mr the... Speaker, the right honourable gentleman is absolutely correct. The UK Government have made sure that pubs and other small hospitality businesses receive a 75% discount on their business rates. In Wales, that has been absolutely slashed, meaning that pubs and small businesses are paying thousands of pounds more as a result of being located under the remit of a Welsh Labour Government. And that, Mr Speaker, is an absolute disgrace. Christopher Blount. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Can I return the Secretary of State to the issue of the Rhondda Tunnel? Because the Chancellor of the Exchequer uh, doled out bits and pieces of money to various um, members of Parliament constituencies on the Tory at risk register, um, but didn't <laughs> allocate any money to the Rhondda Tunnel, despite the fact that the, Ch the Secretary of State told me personally in the Chamber that we should be applying for money under the Leveling Up Fund. But that's all gone, hasn't it? So where should we apply for money now for the Rhondda Tunnel? Well, Mr Speaker, there have been three rounds of, of levelling up fund, and the honourable gentleman should know, Mr Speaker, that there are growth deals across the length and breadth of Wales covering every single constituency, and that there were special projects being backed in areas like Newport. Uh, there is an a, a, um, investment zone in a free, uh, free port in Port Talbot. Mr Speaker, the fact of the matter is that constituencies the length and breadth of Wales have benefited from the many projects which this Government has put forward. But I appreciate the Honourable Gentleman's concern for that project in his own constituency and suggest he might try and uh, look at shared prosperity fund money in future. Alan Cairns. Yeah. <coughs> My right honourable friend is well aware that the uh, Chancellor has extended business rate relief at a rate of 75% uh, here in England. But of course, the Welsh Government are refusing to pass that money on to small businesses in Barry and in Cowbridge. Does he think it's completely unfair that a business in Bristol or in Cornwall will pay a lot less business rates than a business in Barry or in Cowbridge in my constituency? Yeah. Mr Speaker, my right honourable friend is absolutely correct. It is extraordinary that the Welsh Labour Government, who received this funding in order to support small businesses within Wales, are failing to pass that funding on. And as a result of that, the average pub in Wales is going to be paying more than £2,000 extra in business rates than a pub in England. The Welsh Labour Government must do more to support small businesses in Wales. The Secretary of State will know that much of monetary policy is in Threadneedle Street, and which will have an effect on interest rates on Welsh businesses and Welsh households. Has he met recently with the Governor of Bank of England? If not, would he invite him to Wales to see the impact of his policies on the Welsh economy? And may I humbly suggest that he holds that meeting with other Welsh MPs in Blackwood, Newbridge, or Risker in my constituency? Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, the the Honourable Gentleman will surely be aware that the Bank of England set interest rates independently, and that's as a result of a policy that was brought in by the former uh, Labour government. And uh, it's been widely accepted that it's right that Bank of England sets the uh, interest rates, not as a result of what politicians are asking them to do, but as a result of what the economy demands. And as a result of the policies that have been pursued by this UK government in conjunction with the Bank of England, Interest, uh, the level of inflation has dropped drastically from over 11% to 4%, and I would like to think that interest rates will soon follow. Shadow Minister Jessica Moore. Yeah. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. This budget will do nothing to deliver a better future for retailers and customers. That's the words of the British Retail Consortium, whose members face 45,000 incidents of theft and 1,300 incidents of violence and abuse every day. To help keep our Welsh high streets safe, we on this side of the House want to fund an extra 13,000 police officers and PCSOs and extra measures to do offenders. Why is it that this government? is failing to tackle the epidemic of shoplifting and support its victims and take it seriously. Yeah. 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 
Well, Mr Speaker, I think the Honourable Lady is actually right to raise this very important issue for retailers. Can I just remind her, though, that the UK Government have provided for an extra 20,000 police officers across the whole of the United Kingdom, and we have repeatedly brought forward legislation which will increase prison sentences and increase punishments of offenders, and very often that legislation has been voted against by members of the, the Honourable Lady's political party. Several Roberts. His government pledged £1 billion to electrify the North Wales main line, and we all know that £1 billion is an uncosted number pulled out of the air. We also now know that Phase 1 goes no further than Tlandidno. How can he explain to the people living in Innismorn and Gwynedd that talk of rail electrification just means more of the same for us? Slow trains, cancelled services and empty election promises. Yeah. 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 Mr Speaker, the UK Government have already shown a commitment to transport in Wales, spending £390 million on improved rail infrastructure over the last control period. In addition to that has been the South Wales Metro, which is part of a UK Government-Welsh Government joint-funded growth deal. The Prime Minister was very, very clear about our commitment to the electrification of the North Wales rail line, and that commitment stands, Mr Speaker. Mr Roberts. The Tory leader in the Senate opposes moves to tackle the effects of excessive holiday homes in our communities. He goes on about, and I quote, anti-tourism and anti-English policies being imposed on the Welsh tourism industry. Now that the Tory Westminster Government is abolishing tax breaks for holiday lets, will he claim that his Chancellor is anti-tourism? Mr Speaker, I would not, but my my, my friend in uh, in the Senate has, has spoken out repeatedly about Welsh Labour Government's plans for an overnight tourism tax, which is going to have a detrimental impact on tourism businesses across Wales. The Honourable Ladies' Party are in partnership with the Welsh Labour Government, and if she really wants to support the Welsh tourism industry, I suggest she tells them that, that she will, her members will vote against Welsh Labour's budget and prevent that tax from coming in. Number three, Mr Speaker. Secretary of State. Mr Speaker, the Government is committed to transforming our electricity network to reach energy security and net zero ambitions. We recently announced an ambitious electricity network package which will reduce consumer bills, bring forward £90 billion of investment over the next 10 years and allow us to harness Wales's renewable resources such as floating offshore wind in the Celtic Sea. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, pylon development for electricity transmission and distribution purposes are very controversial in the communities expected to host them. I have four such potential developments uh, in my constituency. The whole of Carmarthenshire is in uproar. Will he ask the Secretary of State for Energy Security and uh, Net Zero to commission a study into existing technologies such as cable ploughing, which allow undergrounding at comparable cost to pylons? Thursday. Well, Mr Speaker, I do understand the concerns that have been raised in the Honourable Gentleman's constituency, and I appreciate he's discussed this with me previously, and he is championing his constituents' concerns. I have to tell him that the information I've been given is that laying cables underground would cost five to seven pounds more. But, but I, I hear what he's saying, and if he has um, a presentation or something that he could forward to me, I should be absolutely delighted to make sure that Desnes can, uh, can, official can see that. So, Michael Fabrica. On the subject of transmission and distribution policy, is my right honourable friend aware that the Senate has now decided to ban GB News? What's his policy on that? <laughs> well, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, there may be a there may be a small saving in electricity uh, 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 by doing that. <laughs> But I think it's, it's very disappointing that the Welsh Labour Government are preventing a perfectly legitimate viewpoint from being heard by members of the Senate who, who would do well to listen to people who don't always agree with everything they say. Jerome Number six, sir. Secretary of State, I appreciate it. Oh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, as my honourable friend knows, healthcare is devolved to the Welsh Government, who have received record levels of funding to deliver on their devolved responsibilities, receiving 20% more funding per person than is received for comparable services in England. And despite this extra money, over 24,000 patients in Wales have been waiting more than two years for treatment. The number of people waiting more than two years for treatment in England, with roughly 20 times the population, is around about 200. Amazing. Mr Speaker, last month in Labour's Wales, fewer than half of red calls were answered by the ambulance service within the necessary eight minutes. Now, this is the Leader of the Opposition's blueprint for government. 
Does my right honourable friend agree with me that instead of campaigning for more politicians in Wales, Labour should be focusing on delivering the, the health services that the people of Wales thoroughly deserve? Yeah. Mr Speaker, I completely agree with my honourable friend. I had to call an ambulance, a 999 call for my father-in-law at 11 o'clock one morning. It arrived at four o'clock the following morning. My father-in-law then had to wait for another six hours outside an AEE unit in the back of an ambulance where the Welsh Labour government in the ambulance base had actually built industrial fans to waft away the diesel fumes. Mr Speaker, this is totally unacceptable. They are cutting the NHS budget in Wales by around £65 million, and yet they can find £120 million extra for more politicians in Cardiff Bay. Oh, Williams. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Health Minister for England announced £200 million extra spending for dentistry. I asked her repeatedly, was this within the English budget, or was it additional, where it would produce a ban as consequential? All she could answer was that it was additional. Repeatedly she said that. Now, can the Secretary of State tell me, does the £200 million extra for dentistry in England produce about £10 million extra for Wales? Or does it produce nothing at all? Or perhaps he doesn't know either. Okay. So say. Well, Mr. Speaker, as a result of the, uh, the budget, around £170 million extra will be going uh, to Wales. The honourable gentleman knows that Wales receives around 20% extra to deliver health care. Uh, and it is therefore absolutely appalling that the Welsh Labour government are unable to deliver the same services that are supplied in England. And isn't it interesting, Mr. Speaker? We're talking about the National Health Service. Labour claim to be the party of the NHS, and where are they, Mr Speaker? They're not standing up for a supplementary on this question because they're absolutely ashamed of the level of health care that they've delivered in Wales. Let this not become a blueprint for the rest of the United Kingdom. Yeah, Mr Speaker, a 90-year-old constituent of mine waited 31 hours in the back of an ambulance outside the Wrexham Myler Hospital waiting to be seen. Betsy Cadwallader Health Board, which serves North Wales, is responsible for 80% of the preventable deaths in Wales. Would the Minister agree with me that the Welsh Labour Government, who run the NHS, is putting lives at risk? Mr Speaker, the Honourable Lady is absolutely right to raise concerns about the level of health care being provided to her constituents in South Wales. And what is really shocking, Mr Speaker, is that when the independent commissioners at the Betsy Cadwallader Health Board raised serious concerns about over £100 million of money being misspent, the Welsh Labour Health Minister called them in and sacked them. No wonder we're not getting the right level of health care in Wales, Mr Speaker. Brendan McNeill. Uh, the Minister, the Secretary of State, sorry, and other uh, Tory MPs bring up a litany of health issues in Wales, but Barnet consequentials are due to... Uh, a result of health spending in England and need in England. Has the UK Government ever made any spending decisions on need in Wales, say in health, and then funded England, Scotland and Northern Ireland as a consequence of Welsh need? You might find that a strange question, because UK decisions are always made on England's need and other people get money as a consequence, which is why the likes of Wales is never going to catch Ireland for as long as Wales is in the UK and not independent, yeah. isn't it? Mr Speaker, in actual fact, the Holtham Review looked at what Welsh needs were and calculated that Wales needed an extra 15%. What the UK Conservative Government did was then to provide Wales with an extra 20%. So the question still stands, Mr Speaker. Why is it that thousands of people in Wales have been waiting for more than two years for treatment when the Welsh Labour Government have been given more money than they actually need to properly fund the health service in Wales? Michael Longgate. Number seven, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, the, um, I'm afraid, not very independent commission was set up by Welsh Labour ministers. It reports to Welsh Labour ministers, but it was paid for by Welsh taxpayers. And the report they came out with was entirely in line with all the predictions which I made. More constitutional navel-gazing, more calls for poor, more powers, and nothing at all to address the problems that have been inflicted on Wales by the Welsh Labour government. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, it is deeply concerning that a so-called independent commission described Welsh independence as viable, despite the fact that the vast majority of people in Wales support remaining part of the Union. Of course, there is a difference with something that might be viable and something that is best. Does my right honourable friend agree with me that independence for Wales would be hugely damaging 
to the Welsh economy and public services, and any further exploration of this idea must be immediately ruled out by the Labour Welsh Government. Mr Speaker, I completely agree with the Honourable Gentleman. It is hugely concerning that the Welsh Labour Government were even willing to consider independence for Wales with this Commission. What they should be doing, Mr Speaker, is to sort out the longest, hospital, the longest NHS waiting list in the United Kingdom. They should do something about the fact we have the lowest educational standards in the United Kingdom. We have in Wales some of the highest business rates in the United Kingdom. And as a result of the last bit of legislation, we have some of the slowest speed limits in the whole of the United Kingdom. It's time the Welsh Labour Government addressed the real priorities of the people in Wales with the powers they already have. The Conservative Party never wanted devolution in Wales or Scotland in the first place, and that's why they don't want to see powers extended to either the Senate or the Scottish Parliament. The reality is that I campaigned against the Senate in the first place, but I was perfectly happy to accept the results of the referendum. And I suggest that members of the SNP ought to similarly respect the results of independence referendums, whether it's independence from the United Kingdom or independence from the European Union. Dr Luke Evans. Number eight, Mr Speaker. Secretary of State. Mr Speaker, the recent protests by farmers across the whole of Wales, including outside the Senate, show the huge anger about the proposals for the Welsh Labour Government's so-called sustainable farming scheme. To Luke Evans. Thank you, Mr Speaker. One of the best ways we can support Welsh farmers is by choosing to buy British products. This is good for the environment, reducing food miles, and it's good for our food security by supporting our farmers. So would the Minister congratulate Morrison's, Aldi, Sainsbury's and now Ocado, who have all signed up to my campaign to have a Buy British button online so consumers can easily find British produce? I completely agree with the honourable gentleman about buying British, although I might go one step further and suggest that we buy Welsh food wherever possible. <laughs> but it's, it's going to be a lot more difficult if Labour implement their plans to bury 10% of Welsh agricultural land under trees and to bury another 10% under ponds. Mr Speaker, it will increase food miles, decrease food security and destroy prime agricultural land in Wales. And the Welsh Labour government need to think again. Jim Shannon, final. Mr Speaker, the best way to support Welsh farmers and Northern Ireland farmers and Scottish farmers and English farmers <laughs> is to buy British. Does the Minister agree that we should all work together across all this great United Kingdom of Britain and Northern Ireland to promote farming everywhere? Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, the Honourable Gentleman is absolutely right. Let's encourage everyone to buy British and let's make sure that we use as much of our land as possible for growing food, not covering it in trees. And Mr Speaker, it's particularly hypocritical for the Welsh Government to tell farmers they have to plant trees on their land when the Welsh Labour Government are responsible for thousands of acres of forest, are chopping down 850,000 tonnes of trees every year, and they're even putting some of them into the boiler, which heats up the Senate. Not that that probably requires many trees to add to the hot air in there. We now come to questions to Prime Minister Absol Khan. Question number one. Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, the post office IT scandal is one of the greatest miscarriages of justice in our nation's history, and I am determined that the victims get the justice and redress that they deserve. Today we are introducing legislation to quash convictions resulting from this scandal. The Department for Business and Trade will be responsible for the new redress scheme, and we are widening access to the optional £75,000 payment. Hundreds of innocent sub-postmasters have fought long and hard for justice. With this bill, we will deliver it. Meetings with ministerial colleagues and others, in addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Mr Speaker, despite serious opposition from the Archbishop of Canterbury, three former Home Secretaries and three Government Ministers advisers on anti-Semitism, social cohesion and on political violence, the levelling up sector is due to widen the definition of extremism tomorrow. Whilst on the benches opposite, members peddle far-right conspiracy theories about Islamists and Muslims taking over Britain. Shouldn't the Prime Minister's priority be getting his own house in order and stepping out extremism, racism and Islamophobia from within his Conservative Party? And will the Prime Minister finally take Islamophobia seriously 
and agree to the definition. Minister. Uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, discrimination has no place in our society, and it's important to distinguish. It's important to distinguish between strongly felt political debate on one hand and unacceptable acts of abuse, intimidation and violence on the other. I would urge him to wait for the details of the strategy. It's a sensitive matter, but it's one that we must tackle because there has been a rise in extremists who are trying to hijack our democracy. That must be confronted. And he talks about peddling conspiracy theories. I would just point him in the direction of his previous Labour candidate in Rochdale. Tobias Elwood. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Armed Forces personnel who serve their country for 15, uh, 15 years are eligible for the Long Service Good Conduct Medal, and similar medals are in place for those who make a career of serving in the police, the fire, the ambulance service, and the Coast Guard. But as I learnt on a recent visit to Bournemouth Hospital, where I met the dedicated staff there, no such accolade is in place for the NHS. Would the Prime Minister please support my campaign to see if this anomaly can be corrected, so the nation can formally recognise those who devote much of their working lives in the NHS to helping others. Yeah. Yeah. Minister. My uh, right honourable friend is right that our incredible NHS staff deserve our utmost thanks for their service. And I'm pleased that many NHS organisations, as he knows, have their own schemes in place to do that. We also, of course, recognise NHS staff who are outstanding through our honours system, and MPs are able to acknowledge their work through the NHS Parliamentary Awards, and nominations remain open for that, and I would encourage colleagues uh, to avail themselves of it. But I will make sure that he gets to meet the Secretary of State to discuss his specific proposals further. We now come to Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I welcome the legislation on the Post Office scandal? Mr Speaker, this week we lost the formidable Tommy McAvoy. He served his hometown of Rutherglen and the Labour government with loyalty and good humour, and we send our deepest sympathies to his wife, Eleanor, and their family. We also learned that the Right Honourable Member for Maidenhead will be taking her well-deserved retirement. She has served this House and her constituents with a real sense of duty, and her unwavering commitment to ending modern slavery is commended by all of us. We thank her for her service. Is the Prime Minister proud to be bankrolled by someone using racist and misogynist language when he says the member for Hackney North and Stoke Newington makes you want to hate all black women? Minister. Mr Speaker, the alleged comments were wrong, they were racist, and he has now, as I said, the comments were wrong, they were racist. He has rightly apologised for them, and that remorse, and that remorse should be accepted, Mr Speaker. There is no place for racism in Britain, and the government that I lead is living proof of that. Mr Speaker, the man bankrolling the Prime Minister also said that the member for Hackney North should be shot. How low would he have to sink? What racist, woman-hating threat of violence would he have to make before the Prime Minister plucked up the courage to hand back the £10 million that he's taken from him? Well, Mr Speaker, as I said, the gentleman apologised genuinely for his comments, and that remorse should be accepted. But he talks about language. He, he might want to reflect on the double standards of his deputy leader, of his deputy leader calling her opponent scum, Mr. Speaker. His shadow, his shadow, his shadow foreign secretary, the shadow foreign secretary, comparing conservatives to Nazis, Mr. Speaker, and the man that he wanted to make chancellor. The man that he wanted to make Chancellor talking about lynching a female minister. His silence on that speaks volumes. Mr Speaker, the difference is he's scared of his party. I've changed my party. And Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker. I want you both the Prime Minister and lead the opposition. Please come. Two weeks ago, the Prime Minister invited himself into everyone's living room at six o'clock on a Friday evening. No one asked him to give that speech. He chose to do it. He chose to anoint himself 
as the great healer and pose as some kind of unifier. But when the man bankrolling his election says the member for Hackney North should be shot, he suddenly finds himself tongue-tied, shrinking in sophistry, hoping he can deflect for long enough that we'll all go away. What does the Prime Minister think it was about the hundreds of millions of pounds of NHS contracts given to Frank Hester by his government that first attracted him to giving £10 million to the Tory party in the first place? Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I'm absolutely not going to take any lectures from somebody, from somebody, from somebody who chose to represent an anti-Semitic terrorist group, Hizbut Tahrir who chose to serve a leader who let anti-Semitism run rife in this Labour Party. Those are his actions, those are his values, and that's how he should be judged. Mr Speaker, the problem is he's describing a Labour Party that no longer exists. I'm describing describing the man who is bankrolling their upcoming general election. They, they can shout all they like. Two weeks ago, he marched them out like fools to defend Islamophobia, and now the member for Ashfield is warming up the opposition benches for them. And yesterday, yesterday, he sent them out to play down racism and misogyny until he was forced to change course. He won't hand the money back. He won't comment on how convenient it is that a man handed huge NHS contracts by his government is now his party's biggest donor. You have to wonder what the point is of a Prime Minister who can't lead and a party that can't govern. And Mr Speaker, national insurance contributions fund state pensions and the NHS. So is the Prime Minister's latest unfunded £46 billion promise to scrap national insurance going to be paid for by cuts to state pensions or cuts to the NHS? Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, I'm glad he's brought up the budget. It's about time that he spoke about his plans, because what have we heard, Mr Speaker, from the Shadow Chief Secretary... The Shadow Chief Secretary of the Treasury confirmed. Shh, Prime Minister. The Shadow Chief Secretary of the Treasury has confirmed that the Labour Party will not be sticking to the Conservative government spending plans. So we now have a litany, a litany of unfunded promises on the NHS, on mental health, on dentistry, on breakfast clubs, and that doesn't even include the £28 billion 2030 eco-pledge that he's still committed to. But what we all know, Mr Speaker, is that while we're cutting taxes, Labour's unfunded promises mean higher taxes for working Britain. Uh, uh, No, Mr Speaker, the Labour Party will not be sticking to his completely unfunded £46 billion promise. But he thinks he can can trick people into believing that, but simply shaking the Tory magic money tree will bring it into existence. No, no, let's be clear. 80% of national insurance is spent on social security and pensions. 20% is spent on the NHS. So he's either cutting pensions or the NHS, or he will have to raise other taxes or borrowing. Which is it, Prime Minister? Mr Speaker, I know, I know it's not a strong point, but if you actually listen to the Chancellor last week, what he would have seen is NHS spending is going up, Mr Speaker. It's going up. It's a plan that's backed by the NHS CEO, who says that we're giving her what she needs. And at the same time, we are responsibly cutting taxes for millions of people in work. An average worker benefiting from a £900 tax cut, Mr Speaker. But what I'm hearing from him is he's against our plans to cut national insurance. The highest tax burden since the Second World War. I did listen to the Chancellor. £46 billion of unfunded commitments. They tried that under the last administration, and everybody else is paying the price. But two weeks ago, the Prime Minister promised to crack down on those spreading hate. Today, he shrunk at the first challenge. Last week, he promised fantasy tax cuts. Now he's pretending it can all be paid for with no impact on pensions or the NHS. All we need now, Mr Speaker, is an especially hardy lettuce, and it could be 2022 all over again. Is it any wonder 
that he's too scared to call an election when the public can see that the only way to protect their country, their pension and their NHS from the madness of this Tory party is by voting Labour. Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, again... No, Prime Minister. Mr Speaker. He talks about pensions. Pensions are going up by around £900 in this year. It's this government that's protected the triple lock for the last 10 years. He talks about supporting working people. It's this government that's cutting taxes for every single person in work, Mr Speaker. It's this government that's investing in the NHS. But all we have from him are all we have from him is a £28 billion unfunded promise. Mr Speaker, I had a look at it. I had a look at it. It's here. It's all here. Making Britain a clean energy superpower, he's still stuck to it, Mr. Speaker. And if you look through it carefully, there's billions in spending he's already committed to Scotland, billions for Wales, there's actually money for North London too, I notice. But the problem is, the problem is, the problem is, none of it is funded. So why doesn't he come clean and tell him under his plans Britain people's taxes are going up, Mr. Speaker? Richard Graham. Mr. Speaker. Millions of people around the UK and Europe have been inspired by the brilliance of Six Nations Rugby. And Premier League clubs like Gloucester Rugby, which were funded during the pandemic through loans authorised by the Prime Minister as then Chancellor, have always been grateful for being kept solvent. But the Prime Minister will also know that the finances of some of these clubs are fragile and that the current loan repayment schemes could be crippling. So will my right hon. Friend ask the Sports Minister and the Treasury to try and find a solution through this so that taxpayer interests are protected and all of us can go on being inspired by top-class rugby for years to come. Yeah. Well, Mr Minister. Speaker, my honourable friend is absolutely right that we stepped in with a £150 million financial lifeline to ensure the survival of Premiership Rugby League clubs during the pandemic. And I am told that DCMS is working with Sport England as the agent to talk to borrowers with concerns about their loan agreements, and any ones that do have concerns should contact Sport England in the normal way. But I can also proudly tell him that we are talking to the Rugby Football Union and the Premiership League to secure not just the future of Rugby Union, but also his local Gloucester Rugby. We come to the leader of the SNP, Stephen Flynn. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I wish to begin by wishing Ramadan Mubarak to Muslims across these aisles. Mr Speaker, the Conservative Party have accepted a £10 million donation from an individual who has said that one of our parliamentary colleagues in this chamber should be shot. Why is the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom putting money before morals? Mr Speaker, as I said, the comments were wrong. The gentleman in question has apologised for them, and that remorse should be accepted. Stephen Flynn. This is complete rubbish. The gentleman in question apologised for being rude. He wasn't rude. He was racist. He was odious. And he was downright bloody dangerous. Now, on Monday, the number 10 said, we've seen an unacceptable rise in extremist activity, which is seeking to divide our society and hijack our democratic institutions. Isn't the extremism that we should all be worried about? The, the views of those Tory donors that we've read about this week. Yeah. Prime Minister. No, Mr Speaker, there has actually been a rise in extremist activity that is seeking to hijack our democratic institutions. Yeah. It's important, it is important, it is important that we have the tools to tackle this threat. That's what the extremes and strategy will do, and I would urge him to wait for the community secretary to release the details. Well, Gwens. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, yeah. Sub postmasters across the country will welcome the government's announcement today on the introduction of legislation to overturn the convictions of those who were wrongly convicted. But can my right honourable friend reassure this House that that legislation will be passed as quickly as possible, and we will support all sub postmasters right across our United Kingdom? Yeah. Prime Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, as I said, I want to pay tribute to all postmasters who have campaigned tirelessly for justice, including those who tragically won't see the justice that they deserve. Today's legislation marks an important step in finally clearing their names. 
and across this House we owe it to them to progress this legislation as soon as possible before summer recess so that we can deliver the justice that they have fought for. We are continuing to work with our counterparts in Scotland and Northern Ireland as they develop their plans, but regardless of where and how convictions are quashed, redress will be paid to victims across the whole of our United Kingdom on exactly the same basis. Ed Dick. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The future of children's cancer services. Ed David. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The, the future of children's cancer services in my constituency across South West London, across Surrey, Sussex, and beyond will be decided by NHS England tomorrow. The existing service is world leading and has saved the lives of countless children. Many of us who have engaged with the consultation process feel that a wrong decision is about to be made, ignoring risk to children's cancer care by moving them to the Evelina. If the Evelina is chosen tomorrow, will the Prime Minister personally intervene and delay any final decision until he's met with myself and concerned, concerned MPs across the House so he can prevent these risks to our children's cancer services. Minister. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, as the Honourable Gentleman, gentleman knows, uh, decisions about clinical provision are rightly made by clinicians in local areas across the country. Uh, more generally, we are investing in more oncologists, radiologists and community diagnostic centres, which are contributing to cancer treatment being at record levels. But I will, of course, ensure that he and colleagues uh, get a meeting with the Secretary of State. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Radical Islamists pose a serious threat to our nation's security, oh, yeah. and I agree with my right honourable friend that we must urgently address this. But reports that the government wishes to broaden the definition of extremism are concerning because in separating the definition of extremism from actual violence and harm, we may criminalise people with a wide range of legitimate views and have a chilling effect on free speech. So can my right honourable friend reassure me that instead of trying to police people's thought and speech, as those opposite clearly wish to do, the government will instead target the specific groups that foster terrorism and those who fund them? Prime Minister. My uh, moral friend makes a good point, and that is why uh, the strategy that I would urge her to wait for will, I think, be one that she can support, because it is our duty to make sure the government has the tools to tackle the threat that she rightly identifies and highlights. And This is absolutely not about silencing those with private and peaceful <laughs> beliefs, nor will it impact free speech, which we on this side of the House will always strive to protect. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Children deserve the right to breathe clean air. Yes. However, many schools are in areas with high levels of air pollution. Sadiq Khan, the Mayor of London, has announced. Sadiq Khan, the Mayor of London, has announced a pilot for 200 of London's most impacted schools to access air quality filters so children can breathe clean air Excellent. in their classrooms. Excellent. Does the Prime Minister support this pilot and will he implement similar measures across our country? Yeah. Mr Speaker, I'm pleased that latest published figures show that air pollution has reduced significantly since 2010 and partly due to our targets Partly due to our legally binding targets to reduce concentrations, they will continue to reduce over the following years. And on top of that, we've also provided almost a billion pounds to help local authorities across the country implement local plans to reduce NO2 and make sure that we can support those impacted by those plans. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I understand the latest scheme that's been considered is to pay migrants thousands of pounds to leave Britain. Prime Minister, let's just leave the ECHR and deport them for free. So far, over 40,000 Brits have signed my petition with the Conservative Post calling for us to leave the European Convention on Human Rights. Will the Prime Minister commit to leaving the ECHR, or at the very least, have it in our manifesto to have a referendum and let Britain decide? Prime Minister. Oh, Mr Speaker, my 
Honourable friend is absolutely right that we must do everything we can to secure our borders, ensure that those who come here illegally do not have the ability to stay. That is why our Rwanda scheme and legislation is so important. And what I have said repeatedly and will happily say to her again is that I will not let a foreign court block our ability to send people to Rwanda when the time comes. Roberts. The National Theatre production, Nye, which stars Michael Sheen, celebrates at the end a transformational increase in life expectancy since the founding of the NHS. But UCL findings indicate that austerity policies between 2010 and 2019 are responsible for a three-year setback in life expectancy progress. Does he, or the Leader of the Opposition for that matter, think public services can withstand an extra £20 billion pounds of cuts? Yeah, well, Mr. M- Mr. Speaker, first of all, I'm pleased that the National Theatre have received significant funding from the Chancellor in the recent budget to support their fantastic work across the UK. But I, I am surprised to hear her raising the NHS when it's her party that's propping up the Welsh Labour government yeah. in Wales, which has absolutely the worst NHS performance of any part of the United Kingdom. Yeah. Mr Speaker, may I thank my right honourable friend for meeting me six weeks ago to discuss the plight of victims of COVID-19 vaccine damage. And may I ask him, following that discussion and his very sympathetic response during the GB People's Forum to Mr John Watt, who himself is a victim of COVID-19 vaccine damage, whether the government will be supporting my COVID-19 vaccine payments bill this Friday. Mr Speaker, can I thank my honourable friend for raising the issue and the conversation that I had with him previously and extend my sympathies to all of those who have been affected by this. I I will, of course, make sure that he can meet with the Secretary of State to discuss his bill. And as I committed to him, we are looking at the issue in some detail to make sure that the policies we've got are providing the support that they need to. Speaker. The Prime Minister stood outside Downing Street saying that he wanted to root out hate and extremism. Yet it shamefully took him more than 24 hours Shame. to finally say the Shame. remarks by the Tories' biggest donor that looking at the right honourable member for Hackney North and Stoke Newen, Newington makes you want to hate all Shame. black women yeah. were indeed racist. Yep. Yeah. In November, the Prime Minister accepted a non-cash donation to the tune of £15,000 from Frank Hester for the use of his helicopter. Mm. So will he reimburse him, yes or no? <coughs> no, Mr Speaker. And I'm pleased that, I'm pleased that, I'm pleased that the gentleman is supporting a party that represents one of the most diverse governments in this country's history, led by this country's first British Asian Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Uh, Later today, I look forward to voting for a tax cut for thousands of my constituents, a national insurance tax cut that will mean £900 off the tax bill for thousands of my constituents. After listening to the rhetoric from the Leader of the Opposition today, does the Prime Minister expect that the main opposition party will vote against this afternoon's tax oh. cuts. Well, well, my right honourable, my right honourable friend raises an excellent question because whilst on this side of the house we believe in a country where hard work is rewarded and people can keep more of their hard-earned money which is why we're cutting their taxes by an average of 900 pounds each we hear consistently from the party opposite not only do they disagree with that approach they continue to cling to unfunded spending promises that would put taxes up but also the shadow chief secretary of the treasury we learned just yesterday describe our plan to end the double taxation on work as morally abhorrent. And that is a contrast between us and them. Labour will put your taxes up and the Conservatives will keep cutting them. 
Thank you, but, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Speaker. Many of his backbenchers, and now it seems the Prime Minister himself, have taken to referring to the European Court of Human Rights as a foreign court, as if there's something inherently wrong with things being foreign or people being right. foreign. Exactly. In what way can a court that the UK has belonged to since 1953, which has an Irish president and a UK justice with an LLB from Dundee, be considered foreign? I think the House needs to hear the Prime Minister commit today to the UK's continued membership of a court and a convention which has protected our rights and freedoms for over 70 years. Yeah. Mr Speaker, when it comes to the issue of tackling illegal migration, when Parliament expresses a clear view on what it believes should happen, supports that with legislation, and that we believe we are acting in accordance with all our international obligations, I have been very clear that I will not let a foreign court stop us from sending illegal migrants to Rwanda. That is the right policy and, in fact, the only way to ensure security of our borders and end the unfairness of illegal migration. As a general election is not just a mere expression of opinion but a serious choice, will my right honourable friend agree that there is only one potential party of government that has the will, the inclination and the determination to stop mass illegal and legal migration, and that is the Conservative Party. Let's unite our movement and do that. Well, I, uh, I agree, agree with my honourable friend entirely. I agree with my honourable friend entirely. And we know this because not only has the Royal Mar gentleman opposite opposed the scheme, he's been clear that even when the scheme is implemented and working, he would still scrap it, Mr Speaker, which tells you everything you need to know. On this issue, their values are simply not those of the British people. There's only one party that's going to stop the boats. It's the Conservative Party. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Under this Conservative Government's watch, Thames Water have dumped over 72 billion litres of sewage into London's rivers, all whilst racking up multi-billion pound debts, and reports are now that they could go bust any day. Despite this, the Government is still refusing to publish their contingency plans for the collapse of our country's biggest water firm. So, yes or no, does the Prime Minister believe that Thames Water will still exist by the end of the year. Prime Minister. Yeah, well, Mr Speaker, it wouldn't be right for me to comment on individual companies, but what I can say is that our ambitious storm overflow reduction plan is backed by £60 billion of capital investment. We now monitor every single storm overflow across England and have legislated to introduce unlimited penalties on water companies that breach their obligations. The independent regulator and the Environment Agency have the powers they need to hold water companies, wherever they are, to account. Natalie Elphin. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, later this year, a new digital EU border system will come in, and yet key di- changes that are required, key details, have still not been decided by the EU. There are urgent decisions that are needed on additional funding and preparation to keep Dover clear and Kent moving through with its traffic. Can my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, assure me that this issue is being taken seriously at the highest levels of government and that funding and support will be made available to keep Dover clear, support the residents of Dover and Deal and Kent, and to secure our vital cross-channel trade and tourism? Prime Minister. No, my uh, honourable friend is right to raise this issue, and I can assure her that it is being discussed at the highest levels of government between UK ministers and EU and French counterparts to make sure that we have practical and constructive solutions that will ease the flow of traffic in the way that she describes and will benefit her local communities. Rachel McCaskill. Thank you, Mr Speaker. 158 days and there is no peace and no justice. There is no food, there is no clean water, there is no sanitation and no medical aid. There are just no words left as disease is spreading and the death toll is rising, not least amongst children, victims of these atrocities. It is evident that the Prime Minister's plan is not working. So will he change track for the sake of these children and so many more and work to secure a bilateral immediate ceasefire between Israel and Hamas? Prime Minister. (laughs) Mr Speaker, I have said repeatedly that we are incredibly concerned about the growing humanitarian crisis in Gaza. 
too many civilians have lost their lives and nowhere near enough aid is getting through. And in contrast to what the Honourable Lady said, actually the UK is playing a leading role in alleviating that suffering, just recently increasing the amount of aid this year to £100 million. Just today, 150 tonnes of UK aid is due to arrive in Gaza, and a full field hospital flown from Manchester to the Middle East last week will also arrive in Gaza in the coming days, staffed by UK and local medics to provide life-saving care. We are doing absolutely everything we can, working with our allies, to bring much-needed aid to the people of Gaza. Show them report. Mr Speaker, now, will my right honourable friend join me in thanking the maternity team at the Royal Cornwall Hospital at Trelisk in my Truro and Falmouth constituency for all their outstanding work they've done to improve maternity <laughs> services over the last few years? Their sheer hard work, along with the coming new Women and Children's Hospital, mean that there are now no midwifery vacancies in Cornwall, which I think you'll agree is a fantastic achievement. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, can I thank my uh, honourable friend for highlighting the improvement in maternity services at the Royal Cornwall? And she, in particular, is a tireless campaigner for reducing baby loss, and I commend her for her recent work on the introduction of baby loss certificates. And as she knows, we are committed to a new women and children's hospital for my honourable friend's local trust in 2030 as part of the new hospital programme. Sarah Dyke. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My constituents in Somerton and Froome, working together with the Langport Transport Group, submitted a robust strategic business case to the Government in July 2022 for the reopening of a train station in the Somerton and Langport area, a train station that would connect over 50,000 people to the rail network, boost the local economy and support local people to reduce their reliance on their cars. Almost two years on, they are still waiting for a response. So does the Prime Minister support this project and can he provide confidence to my constituents that their hard work to drive this vital project forward has not been futile? Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, well, Mr. Mr Speaker, Conservatives in the South West are rightly championing the reopen yeah. of local stations. And actually, recently, Columpton and Wellington will be one of the places that receives funding as a result of our decision on HS2. But it's because of that decision that we now have freed up billions of pounds of funding to invest in local transport across the country, and it will be local leaders that will be put in charge of that many to prioritise their local needs. Yeah. Final question, Mark Francois. Thanks. Prime Minister, in the 1930s, one of your less illustrious predecessors, Neville Chamberlain, so denuded the British Armed Forces of funding until it was too late that we failed to deter Adolf Hitler and 50 million people tragically died in the Second World War. Russia has invaded Ukraine. China is threatening Taiwan. British shipping is being attacked by Houthis in the Red Sea. As the son of a D-Day veteran, could you please assure me and the House of Commons we are not going to forget the lessons of history and make the same mistake again. Prime Minister. Well, can I thank my honourable friend for his tireless campaigning for our armed forces? And he's right to champion them and the role that they play. And I agree with him wholeheartedly that, sadly, the world that we are living in is becoming both more challenging strategically and more dangerous. And in response to those challenges, we must invest more in our armed forces. That is exactly what we are doing, with the largest uplift since the Cold War and recently topped up with billions of pounds to strengthen our nuclear enterprise and rebuild stockpiles. He rightly mentioned the threat posed by the Houthis and Russia and Ukraine, and I know that he will be proud of the role that the United Kingdom is playing in both of those situations. We are respected and valued by our allies, but most importantly, we on this side of the House will do whatever it takes to keep our country safe. Yeah. That completes Prime Minister's questions.
Which we now come to the urgent question. Caroline Lucas. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. To ask the Secretary of State for Energy Security and Net Zero to make a statement on the Government plan to build new gas-fired power stations. Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The second review of electricity market arrangements consultation was launched yesterday, and it sets out the choices uh, that we need to make in delivering a fully decarbonised electricity system by 2035. This Government has already reduced emissions from power by 65 per cent since 2010, and thus made the UK the first major economy in the world to halve emissions overall, from less than 7 per cent of electricity supply in 2010 to nearly 50 per cent today. We have built record volumes of renewables, allowing us to remove coal altogether by October this year. Our success in growing renewables is why we need flexible backup for when the wind does not blow and the sun does not shine. Our main source of flexible power today is unabated gas. More than half of that 15 gigawatts of combined cycle gas turbines could retire by 2035. Meanwhile, electricity demand is set to increase as heat transport and industry electrify. We must ensure that we have sufficient sources of flexibility in place to guarantee security of supply. We need up to 55 gigawatts of short duration flexibility and between 30 and 50 gigawatts of long duration flexibility. Our aim is for as much of this capacity as possible to be low carbon. But, Mr. Speaker, whilst low carbon technologies scale up, we will extend the life of our existing gas assets, but a limited amount of new build gas capacity will also be required in the short term to replace expiring plants as the only mature technology capable of providing sustained flexible capacity. We remain committed to delivering a fully decarbonised electricity supply by 2035, subject to security of supply, and we expect most new gas capacity to be built net zero ready. This Government has committed £20 billion to CCUS and is developing comprehensive support for hydrogen. So in the future, unabated gas plants will only run a limited number of hours per year, so emissions will be entirely in line with our legally binding carbon budgets. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I just start by saying that I am a bit tired of this Government shunning any scrutiny of their climate record and instead relying on a past record, because while the UK may indeed be the first major economy to cut its territorial emissions by half since 1990, we are not on track. We are not on track to achieve our 2030 targets, and if we factor in consumption emissions, then the UK has only cut emissions by 23 per cent. So let's have a little less complacency from the Minister. Now, he will know this Government's uh, new announcement for new gas-fired uh, power stations does, in fact, contrary to what he claim, claimed, risk undermining our climate targets and leaving the country reliant on imports of expensive gas. Members should have been given the opportunity to question the Minister on its implications for decarbonising the UK's energy system by 2035 with 95% of the UK electricity being low carbon by 2030. So first, why was this statement not made in Parliament? Why was it made instead in Chatham House, where members were not able to question the Minister on the impact of this decision? Second, will the Minister explain how this proposal differs from the functioning of the existing capacity market, or will he admit that this is just the Government's latest attempt to stoke a culture war on climate? Third, the Climate Change Committee is clear that there should be no new unabated gas plants built after 2030. So what is the Government's timeline for developing these new gas-fired power stations? I asked him about this yesterday in the Environmental Audit Committee. I didn't get a response. I also asked him what's being done to ensure that these gas plants are zero carbon by 2035. That wasn't set out in either the Secretary of State's speech yesterday or by the Minister uh, today. Uh, the Minister did tell the Environmental Audit Committee that they will be required to be CCS and hydrogen ready. That doesn't actually amount to a meaningful plan. So can he please give us more than just his uh, thus far unevidenced words of assurance? And will he explain what the government's plan is to support the development of batteries and long-term storage technologies and to drive innovation so that we can get off volatile gas for good? 
Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, I mean, rather odd to be asked about uh, being able to scrutinise this. This was the launch of a consultation yesterday, which will be going on for some time. And the Honourable Lady, as she knows, I was in front of the Select Committee yesterday. So rather strange, Mr. Speaker, um, uh, uh, that she, she should highlight that. Um, uh, she's confused, as she often is, because she's so political. She would appear to set politics always ahead of climate. She struggles to recognise that the UNFCCC rules are about territorial emissions, countries own the emissions in the territory where they take place. Her numbers on embedded emissions are wrong, um, but she doesn't care about that. She just carries on a kind of political diatribe um, on the, the government, which has done more than any other in any major economy on this earth to decarbonise its economy. And we have done it, not as the Honourable Lady would have us do, reduced to living in yurts, but actually while growing the economy by 82%. It's people like the Honourable Lady who make people on my side of the chamber at times think, are we engaged in some form of madness? We're not, but she doesn't half make it sound like it. Can these new gas plants be consistent with the government's commitment to decarbonise the power sector by 2035? Our published net zero scenarios, I would invite her to read them, um, for the power sector show that building new gas capacity is consistent with decarbonising electricity by 2035. And on, from those scenarios, we expect, even with new gas capacity, that rather than the 38 per cent of electricity generation, which in 2022 came from gas, it will be down to 1 per cent by 2035, or, if we follow the uh, scenario set out by the Climate Change Committee, perhaps 2 per cent. So we are going to have that as a backup. It's sensible insurance. It's about keeping the lights on while we carry on the remarkable transformation that this Government has achieved, moving from the appalling legacy of the party opposite, less than 7 per cent electricity from renewables, to nearly 50 per cent today. So Jacob rees Thank you, um, Mr Speaker. This announcement on gas-fired power stations is extremely welcome. But at the moment, a kilowatt hour of electricity in the UK costs 44 cents, against 17 cents in the US and 8 cents in both China and India. We have become fundamentally uncompetitive because of this green obsession. We want cheap electricity, and we should have gas, and we should have coal, and we should postpone net zero indefinitely because we are only 1 per cent of global emissions. We are making no difference. And the US economy is going consistently faster than ours because of cheap energy. This is a good first step against the net zero obsession. We need to go further. Minister. Well, I, I would chide my right honourable friend with the science and the evidence which is emerging all the time. There is uh, a climate uh, 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 challenge and a climate emergency. That's why we're, that's why we're looking to uh, reduce our emissions. But he's quite right to also to challenge and say, well, we're less than 1% of global emissions. How does this make sense? That's why we hosted COP26. That's why we got the rest of the world to commit to following us. That's why we're bringing in carbon border, carbon border adjustment mechanism from 2027, precisely to ensure that we create an economically rational system which supports jobs in this country while meeting the, the, cha the climate challenge, which does need to be met. Shadow Minister Dr Alan Whitehead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a little puzzled, uh, frankly, about what all this is about, because the Committee on Climate Change and all credible energy experts have said that we, we will need a small residual of unabated gas on the system for the medium term, and that this is consistent with a fully decarbonised power system. No one disputes that, and indeed, it's barely worth an announcement. We should extend the lives of existing plants to meet that need, and if new build plants are needed in the short term to replace some of those retiring gas-fired power stations, then provided they are capable of converting to hydrogen or carbon capture, as the government says they must be, then there is no disagreement. But that's not what the Secretary of State was saying yesterday at the Chatham House meeting. However, the government's own analysis published yesterday shows that 24 gigawatts of existing gas capacity could be maintained via life extension and refurbishment, and that 9 gigawatts of new capacity is already in the baseline under existing capacity market arrangements. So that's an uncontroversial position and analysis, and again, hardly something that seems making a huge fuss about. But again, that was not what the Minister was talking about, uh, the Secretary of State was talking about 
at the Chatham House conference yesterday. So given this analysis, could the minister enlighten us with the number of new gas plants they are actually hoping to build, given there is no mention of that in the 1,500 pages of documents that were published yesterday? And that's a very important point in terms of what appears to be government's intention to go beyond uh, what is already in the analysis and apparently build a large number of new gas fired power stations for the future. Now, there's a great deal in the review of electricity market arrangements public yesterday that would be worth discussing, not least the government's glaring failure to bring forward the low carbon flexible technologies such as long, distance, long duration storage that everyone knows we will need. And it's a shame that the Minister has not properly addressed this. So can the Minister give us clarity on whether this is a meaningless announcement within existing policy arrangements or an announcement that actually, as has been said, uh, is an attempt uh, to conjure a culture war out of climate and energy policy with announcements with no substance or value and indeed that shows they have no serious plan for energy in our country. Yeah. Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Um, the Honourable Gentleman asked about uh, the, if there are new power plants, them being hydrogen or CCUS ready. Uh, we will legislate to make that a requirement. He asked about how many, um, around five gigawatts, but it, it's so dependent on so many interrelated things. The growth of the low carbon and flexible storage, which we are a world leader in developing. We both support in innovation and, and we, uh, and we uh, support uh, uh, through the capacity market, which he referenced. Um, why he suggests that none of this was clear um, uh, uh, yesterday, it was made absolutely crystal clear. And what we are doing, of course, is we're world leaders with the £20 billion we announced for, for carbon capture, utilisation and storage. And he will remember, because he's been around a long time, that in 2003, the then Labour government said that carbon capture, usage and storage was urgent. There was no route to 2050 without it. And then the Labour government proceeded to do nothing about it. Well, this government is getting on with it. It's putting its money where its mouth is. It's developing those technologies like uh, carbon capture and hydrogen in a way that the Labour government failed to do so uh, clearly, as it did, of course, with renewables to boot. So all they do is talk about climate. The truth is the greatest climate risk to this country would be if Ed Miliband destroys the market and starts to run some state-run quango, which will wreck the renewables growth which we've seen. Um, Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I welcome this announcement. And uh, the, the Independent Committee on Climate Change uh, recognises that we're going to need unabated gas uh, in the electricity uh, market right up until 2035 and beyond. And more widely, that even in 2050, 25% of our energy needs will come from hydrocarbons. So, does the um, right honourable um, member agree with me? that this is exactly the right way to maintain lower energy production costs while still meeting our net zero targets. I do agree with my uh, honourable friend. So the point is to have a, a wide uh, range of backup capacity, but not to use it very much with fossil fuels and to look to, uh, as I think um, uh, has long been the case, that uh, uh, any new gas um, uh, generation should be um, uh, carbon capture ready and we look forward to it being hydrogen ready as well and we are in a very similar position to Germany and other countries who are looking at exactly this. I think both Germany and Ireland for instance as part of their growth of renewables recognise the need for gas albeit used less and less but having it there to ensure the lights stay on and we have appropriate insurance in place. I said peace spokesperson Dave Dugan. What a cluster. It's unbelievable that we are in this situation. I want to quote directly from the Secretary of State's letter to members today in which she said we are taking steps to make sure the lights stay on. That is your legacy of 14 years of the Conservatives in charge of energy. Now, uncomfortably, I find myself in agreement with the, member, the right honourable member for North East Somerset, because this is a significant departure and one which we should be alarmed about. Where is your precious nuclear base load now, or the government's rather? Where is the exemplar of where CCUS is working at this scale that the government is taking inspiration from? And wouldn't it have been an elegant solution to have 
unabated gas winding down at the same time as battery storage, long duration pump storage was all winding up. But we can't have that because the government's dragged its feet on both of those things. What does the minister say to people who are getting infrastructure for transmission all throughout their communities and they're being told to suck it up because this is what we need to do to get gas out of the system? And now the same government is building new gas fired power stations. Uh, the Honourable Gentleman, who is supposed to lead on this subject uh, for his party, um, uh, could, should have listened to what I said earlier. In 2022, it was 38% of generation came from gas. By the mid-2030s, it will be 1% or 2%. Why, why are we having it there? In order to balance the renewables that we are growing, and that we are growing particularly in Scotland, supporting Scottish jobs. And of course, if you put generation in Scotland when the demand is in the south, you have to provide the connecting infrastructure to do it. We had to wire up the UK in order to become the rich and prosperous country that we are today in previous generations. We need to do it again now. We are making sure we are working with local communities, listening to their voices and making sure that they are not misled by people who come up with such nonsense as the honourable gentleman just did. James Wilde. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I commend my honourable friend for his refreshingly clear articulation of our strong record in this area, both in the House today and on the media um, yesterday? And obviously, security of supply must come first. And how will these plans incentivise investment in what is backup gas fired power stations whilst minimising the cost to consumers, which is also very important? Well, I thank my honourable friend. And he and my friend. Um, from Somerset, are absolutely right to focus on the economics. We've got to get the economics of this right. We have used the capacity market in order, a kind of auction type mechanism, to bring forward um, the make sure that we've got the flexible capacity. We're incentivising more and more of that to be low carbon. As you can see, the batteries that are coming on scale, we've got uh, pumps. Uh, hydro storage potentially as well, but we're also, uh, we also need hydrogen and carbon capture, but we're ensuring we've got a balanced system which has discipline built into it in order to drive costs down. And when we have C-bands and other things coming on stream as well, I firmly expect in the 2030s we will have lower cost energy compared to our neighbours and we will be, as my right honourable friend referred to, more economically competitive. Chair of the Select Committee, Angus Brendan McNeill. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy, uh, Mr. Speaker. Stavlov. It's concerning that this is in Chatham House and not here, and it's also concerning that the Secretary of State is not here today as well. Uh, off peace speeches have cost in the past. An energy minister, my committee here this morning, a decade ago, made a speech that cost 1,000 jobs uh, in the effect it had on investment. He says this is a consultation, but have they picked a winner? What room have they given for storage to be in the mix? And are they confusing energy security, and we know we've learned from the Ukraine war what that is, with continual electricity supply? And given what he says the gas percentage will be by 2030 and afterwards, what percentage will this capacity provide? And what percentage, what percentage will this provide of capacity? And what percentage does he envisage will be used day to day? And what other options, and what other thought has given other technologies uh, being considered in this, in his gigawatt demand? Well, I thank the Honourable Gentleman uh, for his question. I suggested on different scenarios around 1 or 2 per cent uh, of total generation coming from gas in the future compared to the 38 per cent in 2022 on, a, on, a, on an annualised basis. But clearly, as the Honourable Gentleman should know better than anybody here with his deep knowledge in the subject, it is based on the intermittency. So it depends how much the sun shines, how much the wind blows. But we have, we make sure that we have a robust system. That's exactly what we're doing. So we, this is, uh, we can continue. And I, I, you know, I'd love to, especially the people who are supposed to care about climate change, like the Green Party, could celebrate this country's global leadership. The fact that we're driving this forward, we're doing so in a way which maintains security of supply, and by bringing more and more rene renewables on with the lowest cost flexibility system to back it up, we're doing so at a more, in a more and more economical fashion. Oh, there's other stuff. Indeed, uh, Mr. Speaker, I welcome this announcement today. It's pure common sense. When the wind uh, isn't blowing, sun isn't shining, we need that uh, security supply. And although we need to, of course, deal with climate change in the medium to long term, we must also deal with security supply in the short term. So I welcome this. But does the minister agree with me that actually, for the medium and longer term uh, security supply, we need to really upscale what we're doing in the hydrogen sector, have more hydrogen production, more hydrogen usage, and be a world leader in hydrogen? At the moment, we are slipping behind a bit. 
Well, I agree with my honourable friend on uh, his point about uh, the importance of hydrogen. Where I disagree with him, having seen the, I think it was eight projects in the hydro hydrogen allocation round one, um, I don't think there's any indication that we're slipping behind. The truth is, uh, the whole world needs to do this because everyone's analysis, from the IEA to the Climate Change Committee to my own department, suggests that hydrogen and carbon capture are necessary to bring about this sort of decarbonised system that we seek. But he's absolutely right on the importance of hydrogen. But, um, and I, I, I would say to him that uh, he, will, he can expect uh, more developments uh, going forward because this country is leading on that as it is in CCUS too. So Mark Hendrick. Mr Speaker, I have a great deal of respect for the Minister and his knowledge on the subject and the fact that he, as we, most of us do in this chamber, uh, recognise the need for cutting carbon and he, I'm sure, is not one of those who would follow the flat earthers that we've seen from the member, that we've seen from the member for North Somerset. But clearly there's a great deal of trust and reliance being put on carbon capture and storage and also on hydrogen both of which, in terms of technologies, are quite, still quite new. We've talked about this stuff for 25 years, and the Minister would seemingly forget that this government has been in power for the last 14 years, and we're still not off the blocks in terms of hydrogen and carbon capture and storage. Is it not the case that uh, the government is taking this position because it's a nod and a wink to the gas and oil industries whose support they'll probably need before the election this year, and this is part of the... Uh, the whole agenda implicating the right wing of his own party. Well, I was with the honourable gentleman nearly all the way, um, and, 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 he's, and he's right. I mean, carbon capture and hydrogen, the whole world is looking at it because that's what the science says. Everybody who looks at it and analyses it says we need it, and it isn't yet at that level a, a great level of maturity. But just as in so many other areas, this country is leading the way. We cut emissions more than anyone else. We've transformed. He knows how dire the legacy is. Uh, uh, party left this country in 2010. I mean, less than 7 per cent. I'm just appalling. Um, and, the, and the real danger, if we go back to that, but that's why we, that's why we have, the, that's why we have the, um, the, the gas power as a backup. So we've got a completely sound system, um, and we, but we believe and, and will seek to deliver a decarbonised system by 2035. The biggest risk to that would be if the right honourable gentleman for Doncaster North were to come in and start to mess with the system, which has lifted us up from the back of uh, uh, of, the, uh, of climate leadership to the front. That's, that's the real danger and that's what we need to avoid. Um, can my right hon. Friend um, stop by South Derbyshire and specifically come to the Willington site, which has already got planning permission for a new gas power station, and um, cut the ribbon when it opens? We want spades in the ground. So I welcome this announcement and I invite him to come and have a look at the Willington site, which is ready to go. Well, I, I agree with my, right, um, with my honourable friend, and uh, I uh, in applaud those who are investing in our system. Uh, we've made ourselves one of the most investable countries in the world for clean energy. Gas has an important part to play in part of that balancing, and with the development uh, of carbon capture and hydrogen, then there's every opportunity for those assets to have an even longer life in a green fashion. And I would love to uh, come and see my honourable friend. Clear off. Mr Speaker, oil and gas are the energy sources of the past, and the reality, of course, with intermittent renewables is that we need an intermittent um, uh, energy source that comes into that. The reality is, of course, gas power plants do the opposite. They don't come in intermittently. They sit there, and when we have too much renewables, the renewable energy is shut off, and gas, the carbon energy, continues to, uh, to, to, to flow. And that is the reality of today. We are wasting renewable energy. Those energy company, uh, uh, sources get cut off while gas continues to flow, and the government uh, 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 does not uh, realise that and does not respond to that. My question is really, can he confirm how many times the government has met with representatives of the oil and gas industry and how that compares with um, uh, representatives of the renewables industry? Uh, well, as so often, the lady does do it spectacularly well. She's completely and utterly wrong. Um, the reason that renewables, as you say, get turned off is because of the constraints within the system, and the reason that gas gets turned on is because the system cannot otherwise cope. That is why we had the transmission acceleration plan. That's why we got the connections action plan. It is, it is, it is something that has come about, and it's being opposed by the honourable gentleman. Every time we try and build the infrastructure out, the honourable gentleman says he's a friend. The SNP wants to be a friend of the renewables industry and Scottish jobs, and then opposes the infrastructure required for it. It's absolutely. Um, uh, 
Uh, I meet with the oil and gas industry a lot because uh, uh, the truth is that even with our world leadership, and we've cut emissions more than any other major economy on the planet, 75% of our primary energy today is still from oil and gas. And we will be dependent on oil and gas in 2050 when we're at net zero. And that's why it is so crazy that the parties opposite, including that of the Honourable Lady, believe that opposing licences, when we're actually dependent on the product, all it will do is see the loss of British jobs yeah. and the import of higher emission product from abroad. It's crazy. And I really do hope that people would think a bit more deeply on the other side and we could hear some common sense. I hear it in the corridors from back benches, but on the front benches and from the Honourable Lady, I hear nothing but nonsense. Because... Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. I welcome uh, this policy decision, which is recognition of reality. Uh, could the Minister confirm that these new plants will actually be able to convert to a low-carbon uh, alternative in the future? Uh, I thank my hon. Friend, and we will be legislating precisely to create that obligation uh, for uh, carbon capture ready uh, and or uh, hydrogen ready. Sam Wilson. Speaker, I hope that this decision is an indication of the realisation, which seems to be slowly dawning on the government, of the impact of the madness of its net zero policy, which has damaged the UK economy. We have the highest electricity prices of most of the countries in the G7. We have uh, lost vast numbers of jobs in energy intensive industries. And now there's a recognition that because of the intermittency, of wind and solar, that there is a risk of blackouts. So I welcome this common sense decision. But since we are going to use gas to power these stations, why does the Minister take the next logical step and legislate to allow us to tap into the vast UK gas resources that we have, which, as the United States has shown, will bring down prices, will give us energy security, and will make our competitive more economy? Well, the, right, uh, the honourable gentleman couldn't be more wrong. Uh, uh, record levels of employment in this country. We overtook France recently as, uh, to become the eighth largest manufacturer in the world. I, I would not expect him to join the dismal party opposite in talking this country down. In truth, we're leading the world in tackling climate change, and we've created more jobs than any time in British history. And going forward into the 2030s, what we're going to do by harnessing more and more of British uh, low uh, uh, carbon energy, renewable energy, is lower bills for families and increase our competitiveness. And as I say, in a world which is increasingly recognising the need for action and is looking to bring in things like carbon border adjustment me a mechanism, effectively, effectively carbon taxes at the border, the truth is the UK is in pole position to grow from its already strong economic position into an even stronger one as a result of the net zero policies of this government. Across London and the South East, many much needed developments that are required for the increase in population have literally been frozen because of lack of supply from the grid. Indeed, nuclear power can provide the base load, renewables are unreliable, and obviously gas is required, particularly at peak times. So will my honourable friend agree with me that actually this is all about topping up the grid at peak times when people want to use electricity because gas is the fastest way to bring a power station onto the grid and equally to shut down? Well, I, I thank my honourable friend and he, he'll be aware of all the work we're doing to um, speed up uh, uh, for instance, transmission, cut it from a 12 to 14 year timeline down to half of that, down to seven years. The Connections Action Plan, which has already moved um, tens of, I think, 40 gigawatts of projects have been able to be, have their connection date moved forward. So we're putting a lot of work in across the piece. This uh, 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 gas uh, capability is there as a backup, but the usage and the emissions resulting from it will be falling precipitately over the next 10 years, and we can all celebrate that. Yeah. Jay, after years of delaying meaningful investment in clean, cheaper, reliable, renewable energy technologies such as tidal and long-duration pumped hydro storage, it's no surprise the government's now having to scramble to create new dirty gas-powered plants. Mm -hmm. But how much does his department estimate these new plants will cost? Mm -hmm. And where is his department suggesting they will be built? Mm -hmm. And what does he mean by carbon capture ready? Does mm. he mean yeah. carbon capture operational? Here, here. Detail. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As I say, um, uh, further 
uh, uh, you know, our, our legislation will come forward in the not too distant future, and she will be able to scrutinise that. And it's extraordinary that she should say to the country that's gone from 7% renewables less than to approaching 50% today that we've gone slow on renewables. We're leading. We, we have decarbonised our power system fast. We've decarbonised our power system faster than any other major economy on the planet. The kind of reality denial that we get from the party opposite is quite extraordinary. And on title, she specifically wants to highlight title. Well, guess which country in the world has more title? The the, honourable, the right honourable gentleman there, who is one of the greatest champions of title in there, he could tell the honourable lady if she's so ignorant. He's a fellow Scottish MP. He can tell her the UK has more tidal deployment than any other nation on the planet. We're proud of that. We're proud of the transformation. And it's about time the SNP and the Labour Party stopped misleading the people and this House. Patrick Reddy. The Minister said earlier that we face a climate challenge after struggling for a word to describe what we face. Why can't the government join the global consensus and admit that what we are facing is a climate emergency? As the, Chair, as the Secretary General of the United Nations said, the era of climate warming is over. We're in an era of climate burning. Well, unlike the Honourable Gentleman, I'm not primarily concerned with uh, words. I'm primarily concerned with action. And I'm glad uh, at our responses. I did actually use the emergency word. I don't know if I broke some uh, golden rule that says government ministers shouldn't say it, but I treat it like it's an emergency. I see uh, the world warming up. I see the negative impacts of climate change. And that's why I spend every single day uh, being proud to be part of a department which is decarbonising its country faster than any other in the world. The Honourable Gentleman should get away from rhetoric and start focusing on action. Jim thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Can I uh, uh, thank the Minister for his answers? And whilst there is certainly an urge to prioritise our net zero uh, promises, I am grateful that the Government are, are talking and backing up precautions into considerations. Northern Ireland plays uh, an important role in any contribution to net zero targets. The Minister has recognised that on many occasions in questions that I have asked him. So will the Minister ensure, in terms of any new gas power stations to be built, that Northern Ireland is considered and prioritised as a leading location for those? Thank you. Minister. Well, the Honourable Gentleman, um, I don't know, he sometimes gives the impression that he'd like it if I was running the energy system in Northern Ireland, but it's not. It's devolved. And we do have ministers back, and that's something of celebration. And I will work closely with ministers in Northern Ireland, as I do with other ministers in devolved um, uh, administrations, because in order to meet our net zero targets, Northern Ireland has to deliver it his. It's, um, Scotland has to deliver its targets. So does Wales. We've got to work together in a spirit of collaboration. We can do that. And if he can persuade his honourable friend beside him that actually it can be done at the, in a way that strengthens our economy too, then we really will have something to celebrate. That completes the urgent question. We now come to the statement. Minister Kevin Heller Ray. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And with permission, I shall make a statement about post office legislation and horizon redress schemes. I'm very pleased to be able to announce that we are introducing today a new bill that will quash the convictions of postmasters in England and Wales affected by the Horizon scandal. As set out in my written statement last month, this legislation will quash all convictions which meet a clear set of conditions. Those in scope will have their convictions quashed on the day that the new legislation is brought into force. Subject to parliamentary passage, our aim is for royal assent to happen as soon as possible before the summer recess. We accept and have always been clear that the legislation may overturn the convictions of some people who are guilty of genuine wrongdoing. However, we believe this is a price worth paying to ensure that many innocent people are exonerated. The Government will, however, seek to mitigate the risk of people receiving financial redress when they have not been wronged. The Government also accepts this legislation is unprecedented. It is an exceptional response to a factually exceptional situation. I want to be clear, however, that this does not set a precedent, nor is it a criticism of the judiciary or the courts who have dealt swiftly with matters brought before them. The fact remains, however, 
that three years after the first convictions were overturned, only around 100 have yet been quashed. And that without government intervention, many of these convictions could not be overturned, either because all the evidence has long been lost, or because, quite simply, postmasters have lost faith in the state and the criminal justice system and would not come forward to seek justice. The legislation will apply to England and Wales only. However, we are fully committed to work with the Scottish Government and the Northern Ireland Executive through regular weekly official level engagement to progress their own approaches. I have met with my counterparts in the Scottish Government and the Northern Ireland Executive to offer support and address their concerns and offer further meetings. The Financial Redress Scheme, of course, will be open to applications from applicants throughout the UK once convictions have been overturned. Can I thank the Business and Trade Committee, which recently published a report including some recommendations for government regarding Horizon Redress. We will, of course, respond to them in the usual way, but today I would like to address two of the recommendations which they make. The first is that responsibility for redress should not lie with the Post Office, that it should be subject to independent oversight. This has also been something recommended to us by the Horizon Compensation Advisory Board. I can announce today that we will be the Department for Business and Trade, rather than the Post Office, which will be responsible for delivery of this redress, which is relating to the overturning of these convictions. Final decisions on redress will be made by independent panels or independent individuals. I shall return to the House at a later date with your permission, Mr Speaker, to provide details on how we intend to deliver redress for those who have had their convictions overturned by this Bill or via subsequent measures taken in Scotland and Northern Ireland. We are discussing these details with the Advisory Board. My honourable friend, my honourable friend the Financial Secretary to the Treasury will be introducing legislation to make any payments made via this new scheme that are exempt from tax. The Select Committee also recommended that the Government should introduce legally binding timeframes to deliver redress for sub postmasters with financial penalties for non compliance. And I strongly support the Committee's desire to speed up redress. We feel their proposed re regime would have the opposite impact. It would mean potentially imposing penalties on forensic accountants or others who are helping postmasters to prepare their claims. Doing that would probably cause some of them to withdraw from this work, which would slow down the delivery of redress. Furthermore, we do not want to be in a position where we are rushing postmasters into major decisions about their claims and the offers they receive possibly meaning some are timed out of redress altogether. The Advisory Board have said that their strong view is that this would be a backward step, and which is why less than two months ago we passed legislation removing the arbitrary deadline from the GLO scheme. We do not want to reverse that change. However, the Government is acting to ensure that redress is delivered as quickly as possible. First, we are working with claimants' lawyers to reduce the number of cases which require expert evidence, for example, forensic accountants or medical evidence, which, do, which does delay claims. We will pilot this approach, and assuming that the pilots succeed, we hope to expand it rapidly. Second, the Advisory Board and I have asked for monthly reports on each scheme. These will come from independent case managers for schemes where they are in place, we will publish those reports, which will give us the best basis on which to assess measures for speeding up redress. Finally, we are introducing optional fixed sum awards. In January, the Government announced it would introduce an offer of an optional £75,000 fixed sum award for those in the Group Litigation Order Scheme. As of 5 March, 110 offers have been accepted, and over 100 of these have taken the £75,000 fixed payment. Of those who have accepted the fixed payment, three quarters are new claims. So the fixed offer has already meant that over 100 claims have been resolved very promptly. In some cases, those people will have got more than they would have asked for. The fixed offer also has had a helpful effect, helpful effect on other claims. It substantially reduces work on small claims by claimants' lawyers making more resource available to, prog to progress larger claims more quickly. 
I am pleased to announce today that the £75,000 fixed sum award offer will also now be extended to the Horizon Shortfall Scheme to ensure that everyone across all the schemes is treated fairly. Those who have already settled their claim below £75,000 will be offered a top-up to bring their total redress to this amount. This means over 2,000 postmasters will benefit quickly from this announcement. We are mindful that claims in the GLO scheme are not being submitted as swiftly as we would like to see. To ensure that we get help to claim it more quickly, we have already announced an optional fixed sum award of £75,000. I can announce today that anyone who chooses not to take that offer but instead submits a full claim for individual assessment will straight away have their interim payment topped up to £50,000. Mr Speaker, many postmasters' lives have been ruined by this scandal. We are working hard to deliver redress. We have set up the Williams Inquiry, which will discover the truth. We will provide fair financial redress as promptly as we can, and we will exonerate those who were so unjustly convicted of crimes which they did not commit. Mr Speaker, I commend this statement to the House. Minister Russia, Nora. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the Minister for advance sight of his statement. Before I begin my response, I would like to put on the record my deep disappointment at the Minister's comment this morning on BBC Breakfast. Uh, instead of categorically condemning the Tory party donor Frank Hester's horrific racist remarks about the right honourable member for Hackney North and Stoke Newington, and despite number 10, after much delay, finally describing the remarks as, I quote, racist and wrong, the Minister this morning appeared to contradict this position. Point four. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this is a statement on post office legislation, and I respectfully say that what the Honourable Lady opposite is saying is irrelevant to this statement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Minister will move on. Minister. I will move on. I will move on. Uh, I simply hope that the Minister will reflect, reflect on the reversal of the statement this morning and the position that he took that he would take a donation if it was submit, provided by the donor. I hope he reflects on the impact that, that it is having on many of us. Turning to Mr Speaker, uh, today's crucial statement, the Horizon scandal is truly shocking, a miscarriage of justice and one of the most devastating in British history. The scandal has brought devastation to the lives of hundreds of falsely convicted sub-postmasters. Over 20 years on, they and their families are still suffering from the consequences and the trauma of all they have been put through. I pay tribute to their determination in pursuing justice. And I want to pay tribute to Alan Bates and the sub-postmasters who have pioneered this campaign and worked tirelessly to seek justice. Without their bravery and perseverance, the campaign would not have come be where it is today. I also want to pay tribute to my right honourable friend, the member for North Durham, uh, for all his work and the campaigning on this issue by Lord Arbuthnot for many years, as well as uh, others in this House and the other House. And members of the Business Select Committee and the Chair. Turning to the legislation, we, of course, welcome the laying of this legislation today. Uh, but before, before giving a full verdict on the legislation, we will need to uh, properly scrutinise the details and analyse its potential impacts. In the first instance, Mr Speaker, this legislation does, in our view, leave a series of outstanding issues and questions as to when justice and compensation will be delivered and to whom. First, I'd like to address the territorial scope uh, of the legislation, as it is currently only applying to England and Wales, uh, even though the post office uh, is not devolved and the Horizon scandal is a UK-wide uh, Horizon system, uh, and the scandal uh, in terms of its impacts is UK-wide. Um, we know there are 30, approximately 30 cases that need overturning between Scotland and Northern Ireland, uh, but there remains a, seri a, a series of outstanding questions as to when sub-postmasters in both Scotland and particularly Northern Ireland will receive justice 
and com compensation. I welcome the Minister's uh, offer of and assurances of having regular uh, dialogue with the devolved administrations, but I'd be grateful if he could provide more, more detail on how that will work in practice, recognising uh, the, the different legal processes. Um, Mr Speaker, additionally, as we know, 80% of the redress budget is yet to be paid out. There remains considerable uncertainty as to when sub-postmasters will receive their compensation. I'm sure we can all agree that the sub-postmasters have waited long enough. The delays are causing further financial distress and further suffering. We note the, the Business and Trade com Select Committee's recommendation of a legally binding time frame from when an offer is first tabled to when settlement is reached. Even if these legally binding targets are not adopted, what assurances can the Minister give that he will meet his target of ensuring all compensation is paid out, is out of the door by the end of the year? What mechanisms will the Minister put in place to ensure that there are no further delays? And, and I know that he is committed to making sure there are no f further delays, but sub-postmasters will want to know that that actually happens. And given the recent chaos in the post office's leadership, we welcome the decision to take the post office out of the redress process. As the minister said, redress must have, an independent, have independent oversight. We know the post office is in disarray, and what we need is focus and efficiency in ensuring compensation is paid to the sub-postmasters as soon as possible. In conclusion, Mr Speaker, the suffering of the sub-postmasters can never come close to being repaid just through financial redress, though it is so important we get this right. The very least the government can do is ensure they receive the fair compensation and exoneration as soon as possible. There are those who have been impacted by the scandal that have sadly passed away, never to be able to see their innocence proven, proven or live to see the compensation they deserve. It is absolutely vital that the government acts with the urgency and speed that's needed to correct this terrible injustice. Well, thank you, Mr Speaker. If I can, see as the comments the Shadow Minister made are on the record, if I can just deal with them very briefly, uh, Mr Speaker, and I've got to say it's the second time I think she's made comments at this dispatch box that have been unfair or factually incorrect. And I hope she doesn't come and correct the record, because if she actually watched the interview I made, I absolutely did condemn the words of Mr Hester. I said they were wrong, I said they were, ra they were racist, and I think it's absolutely right he's apologised, and she should actually watch the full broadcast, and I hope comes back to this House and apologises and corrects the record. In terms of the points she raises, um, I think they largely pertain to the Scottish and Northern Ireland devolved administrations. I quite understand the concern around that and I'm very keen to make sure we get this right across the United Kingdom. I think, as she says in her own comments, they have different legal processes she acknowledges in those areas. Therefore, we think it would be inappropriate for us to legislate for parts of the United Kingdom that have different legal processes, different prosecutors. Justice itself is devolved, although the post office, as she rightly says, is a national organisation, UK-wide organisation. That's why we think the legislation should be we allow those devolved administrations to legislate themselves if that's what they choose to do. We we'll work very closely with them on a weekly basis. Officials are meeting on a weekly basis to assist wherever we can to make sure this is delivered. The compensation can be delivered UK-wide, as is uh, how the scheme operates. I think she said, and I may be wrong here, so I will check the record myself, that uh, I think she says 80% of compensation is yet to be delivered. Can I just say, across the whole, all the schemes, around two-thirds of cases have already received full and final compensation, although in that being the case, some people will be topped up, about 2,000 people will be topped up by the announcement I made earlier, the £75,000. So it's not right to say that the majority of people are waiting for compensation, as I think she said. Um, 
In terms of do we want to deliver by the end of the year, absolutely we do. I'll just point out to her, as I said in my remarks, not everything is within our gift. We can't compel a claimant to submit a claim or when that will happen. So if somebody puts in a, a claim right towards the end of the year, for example, it may not be possible to do that for the end of the year. So not everything is within our gift. Anything that is, we're very keen to expedite. In terms of independent oversight, absolutely critical that we have that. In the overturned conviction schemes, all schemes have independent oversight. In the overturned conviction schemes, we have uh, retired High Court Judge Sir Gary Hickingbottom, um, and on that scheme particularly, we, we have the £600,000 fixed sum award, but also on Mr Hickingbottom's advice, we've introduced the £450,000 payment as soon as a full claim has been submitted. So, uh, so we're doing everything we can to make sure people are compensated as quickly as possible. Paul Scully. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I welcome the Minister's statement, the uh, pragmatic way that he has uh, looked to speed up the claims and take it in-house as best he can, the uh, legislation that's proposed and indeed the extension of the £75,000 to historic shortfall scheme uh, people. I would point the Minister to an, uh, an article in the uh, Times this morning talking about people who may be excluded uh, from, reportedly excluded from the legislation, and ask him if he can give any assurances that people who's, um, who have gone through this process, whose um, original conviction was based substantially on the horizon problems, will in indeed be exonerated and therefore able to compensation, get compensation. OK, I thank him for his question and for his tireless campaigning on this area and his tireless work as my predecessor in this particular role. He did some great work in getting us where we are today, helping to get to where we are today. Yes, he's right to say there are some people that are not exonerated through this process. For example, people who have been before the Court of Appeal. Um, but those people will be able to still be able to appeal again in the light of our legislation today. Of course, they have that right anyway to do that. We will support them where we can to bring forward uh, their cases to the Court of Appeal. And we very much, people, uh, very much hope people who are innocent who, who follow that process are exonerated. We come to SNP spokesperson Marion Fellows. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and apologies for being slightly late. Um, I welcome the oh, thank you to the Minister for a prior sight of his statement. I welcome the announcement of the legislation. It will hopefully go a long way in speeding up full and fair financial redress for a large number of Horizon victims and bring them closer to justice. Furthermore, I welcome the enhanced financial address for those who have experienced Horizon's related shortfalls and those who have already settled for less than £75,000 and that they'll have their redress topped up. I want to pay tribute to the Minister for his hard work in this and also the work, the sterling work of the Horizon Compensation Advisory Board and the ongoing work of Sir Wynne Williams and his inquiry. Most of all, I want to pay tribute to the victims following the unimaginable pain they have been forced to endure at the hands of Post Office Limited and successive UK governments. And I hope today's announcement can give them some hope there is an end in sight to this sorry chapter. I welcome the administration of financial redress schemes have been taken out the hands of Post Office Limited, not before time. Uh, Post Office Limited have demonstrated obfuscation and, and incompetence at every stage. From a Scottish perspective, I'm sure my Northern Irish colleagues will agree with me. I'm disappointed, disappointed deeply that the legislation is confined to England and Wales only. This needs to be addressed to include both Scotland and Northern Ireland to ensure parity. Westminster Parliament is sovereign. Scottish Government Parliament can be challenged on its legislation, and this needs to be looked at. The devolution process also risks slowing things down. Will he and the Government guarantee today that any relevant orders under Section 104 of the Scotland Act are processed quickly by his Government? Scotland has no direct devolved equivalent on postal affairs. Only Westminster has remit for the Post Office and his department. Will the Minister ensure the Bill contains provisions requiring Post Office Limited to fully cooperate with the Scottish Government and supply all needed materials? It is vitally important that victims in Scotland and Northern Ireland do not have to wait any longer for justice than their English and Welsh counterparts. Victims across these aisles suffered enormously at the hands of a wholly reserved institution, and it is essential there is complete parity 
Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, can I thank you again for all the work she does in this area? She, she's been a tireless campaigner herself, and uh, again, one of the reasons we are this, this far on. We'd all like to be further on, but um, really important part of the work that's gone on she's contributed to. And she's right to say victims should be front and centre in terms of how we deliver compensation, we do, that we deliver it fairly, and we deliver it as, as quickly as possible. Um, some of the changes I uh, announced today, that included in, in my remarks, were brought forward on the basis of feedback we've had from victims and the legal representatives. So absolutely we do listen to them and make sure we deliver any changes where we can. I fully understand her, po uh, her points on Scotland and Northern Ireland. She can understand, I think, the constitutional sensitivity around this area. These are tough decisions to make. And, uh, and I quite understand that um, Scottish ministers will also have to make similar decisions. They can make a decision to do what we are doing, of course, and if they do do that, we'll support them in terms of the way they legislate. But given the sensitivities around this, we thought the best way that devolved administrations, where justice is devolved, they should make the, those decisions rather than us. But I, my commitment is again to make sure we work across the piece wherever we can, to deliver that a consistency, of com consistency of compensation that she requires, and not forgetting that the redress schemes are UK-wide. So as soon as people's convictions are overturned, they can access compensation just like they can in England and Wales. Sir Robert Neil. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I think everyone wants to see uh, the uh, suffering uh, of the postmasters brought to an end as swiftly as possible. And I welcome what the Minister says in particular about simplifying and speeding up the compensation scheme uh, he will know that claimant lawyers such as Neil Hudgel, who gave evidence to the uh, Business and Trade Select Committee, have real expertise in this field. And I hope that he will work very closely uh, with the sector uh, to, to maximise that expertise in designing the scheme. But can I just say one note of caution? I know the Minister says that this is exceptional. It is constitutionally unprecedented uh, to overturn convictions uh, uh, imposed by our courts in good faith on the evidence before them at the time uh, by legislation. It is most undesirable, frankly, that we should ever go down that route. And at risk of sounding uh, a note of caution, some of us will need to see the detail of the legislation and will want to see what evidence the Government have that it will be quicker and more comprehensive to quash uh, convictions by this constitutionally unprecedented route, rather than leaving it to the courts with assistance uh, to uh, deal with it, which could have been dealt with, as he knows, by a presumption uh, in favour of their being quashed if they depend upon horizon evidence, rather than this wholesale thing. And in particular, will he look at what impact this will have in relation to uh, rehabilitation of offenders legislation, uh, and also the impact as to whether or not convictions quashed by this legislation will uh, be removed effectively, for example, if you travel to the United States or other foreign jurisdictions where you may need a visa and you will need to be able to show that you do not have an outstanding conviction. Minister. Well, can I thank him for his question and all his work on this himself. And it has been um, very important that we have engaged with him through the process and, and, very, and clearly he has much expertise in this area. We agree with him that this is unprecedented. We agree with him it's undesirable, but we believe it's the least worst option. If you look at the current progress in terms of, and we want to see this delivered more quickly, of the, the 790 or so postmasters we believe this legislation will affect, only around 100 so far the convictions have been overturned. We think that's an untenable situation, which is why we decided to take this route. Uh, but of course I'll continue to work with him and con continue to listen to his very wise advice. In terms of uh, how the, the process for marking the record, um, so I can, I can write in saying if a uh, Court of Appeal overturns a conviction, the uh, record is marked overturned by the Court of Appeal. Uh, we see these records as being marked in a similar way, quashed by Parliament or something along those lines. So, but again, very happy to engage with them to make sure we get that right. Liam Byrne. Madam Deputy Speaker, can I welcome the Minister's statement and can I thank him for the collegiate way in which he is working across the House yeah. uh, to try and bring justice um, for those who have suffered. Um, this is a welcome step forward uh, today. Um, as he knows, and I'm glad to see him take on board some of the recommendations we made in our report last week that set out how we deliver fair, fast and independent redress. The Government has today proposed how it's going to overturn convictions. It has taken the Post Office out of some, but not all, 
processing of claims, and it has crucially increased the number of people who can uh, apply for fixed term um, uh, remuneration. However, the post office is still handling the claims for at least, I think, 100 of those with overturned convictions when it is patently not fit for purpose. For those who seek to contest their claims, the Minister is saying there won't be a legally binding time frame between when they submit that claim and when the initial offer is made by his department. That's a problem. And there's no standard tariff proposed for compensation for key heads of terms, like, for example, loss of reputation. That too is a problem. So this bill today is far more than a half measure. That's true. But it's not yet the full solution. And I just want to leave him with the words of Joe Hamilton, who messaged me last night to highlight the plight of the GLO uh, litigants in particular, um, and the way in which they, in her words, have to justify every last penny, even if some of their claims <coughs> is for actual monies stolen from them by the post office. Why can't the government do the right thing before even more victims die? Those words need to be ringing in our ears as we seek to perfect this bill. Mr. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and can I thank him uh, for his comments and, uh, and his uh, collaboration on this? It's really important that we listen to his recommendation and indeed some of his very informative sessions they've had with the Select Committee, which were, was important. Uh, I sat through all five hours of those sessions. It was, uh, um, so, um, so, yes, at this point in time, we believe the Post Office should continue with its existing uh, work on the cases it's got in front of it, around 100. We have no capacity at the moment within the Department of Business and Trade to handle those claims right now. Clearly, we will have by the time this legislation comes into effect. We don't want to pause between the legislation coming into effect in July and compensation payments being made. We think we can get those payments to people in August using that route. Um, now, there may be some people left in the, uh, in the overturned convictions, the first tranche, the people who have been through the appeal court at that point in time, and we will certainly look at his recommendations in terms of whether we bring those back in-house or leave those with the post office, but that's something we will, we will keep an open mind on. In terms of what I think you might describe as, uh, as fixed timescales to respond to offers or service level agreements, we've got those already for the GLO scheme, that on a submission of a full claim, we commit to responding to 90% of those claims within 40 days. Um, very happy to look at how we might put some benchmarks in place for this new scheme to make sure there's a similar um, speed of response. Um, in terms of standard tariffs, he makes that recommendation. He, he probably listened, I'm sure you heard what I said earlier in terms of uh, some of the new pilots we're doing around working with, with the, some of the lawyers involved here where they can submit claims without the forensic accountants, without the medical uh, reports, which may do something along the lines, he says. So I'll happily have a uh, an ongoing conversation with him. On the GLO scheme, uh, bear in mind that I think so thus far 128 uh, claims have been submitted, I think of the 490 that there are. 110 of those have been settled. And there's only one so far, to my knowledge, or, uh, that has gone yet to the independent, uh, in terms of the arbitration dispute resolution before it goes to the independent panel. So I think it indicates to everybody in the House, hopefully, that generally offers have been made that are, that are fair and they've been accepted uh, almost straight away. So um, I, I understand what Jo Hamilton says, and I've, I've met with Jo about some of the processes she had to go through to prove her claim. We're determined to reduce those kind of frictions and reduce that evidence requirement on things that certainly things that are not essentially material. Um, we've got three things we've got to get right when we're delivering compensation. We've got to be fair to the individual, of course, and their families that have been affected. We've got to be fair to all the other postmasters as well to make sure there's a consistency across the scheme. And, of course, we've got to be fair to the taxpayer. But um, there is no cap on what we're going to pay people as long as it is fair. Duncan Baker. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for, for bringing this to the House today. It clearly uh, moves in the right direction for closure. Uh, many times I have talked in this House about similar issues. Um, a, a billion pounds has been put on the side by the Government to uh, deal with all this, this issue. And that is despite the fact that the Post Office have taken millions upon millions upon millions of postmasters, innocent people. We have never had the figure of what was taken. And I've asked for that before, 
But secondly, I want a second figure. The Jitsu have said on the record that they would help compensate victims as well, add to the remuneration pot. What progress have we made, Minister, on making them pay also for being culpable in this whole fiasco? Well, thank you uh, for his regular comments and cont contributions in this particular area. It's always good to have uh, the, the views of the only uh, former per serving postmaster in this, this house. Um, yeah, we, we are looking at that figure, trying to identify what, uh, what it is, and we will hopefully come back to him at some point. And it's quite complicated. A lot of these records go back a long, long way. But that's a body of work we're undertaking with the Post Office. Um, in terms of Fujitsu, um, the Secretary of State had a conversation yesterday, I think, with the Chief Executive, International, the Global Chief Executive of Fujitsu. So we are, we are keen to make sure that Fujitsu contribute, and they've already said they will. They said they are a moral responsibility to contribute. I think it's fair to say at this point in time, he mentions a billion pounds, but we don't know the final figure in terms of compensation, but we'd expect a significant element of that to come from Fujitsu. Yeah. Alistair Carmichael. Deputy Speaker, can I also thank the Minister for advance sight, not just of his statement, but also, somewhat novelly, the government top lines to take. Uh, that latter document uh, includes this passage. So far, we have identified up to around 800 cases that are potentially in scope. Note, if we use this number in public, we are going to get held to it. There is a risk that we may deliver fewer overturns or award redress to fewer individuals, we will then have to explain that. If it is the view of officials in the Minister's department that accountability and transparency are some sort of problem, then does he really think that they are the people who are best placed to exercise oversight of the compensation scheme? And should that not be put now in the hands of someone who is independent of both government and the post office? Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, it's interesting the figure he uses and, and the document he references. I wasn't aware that he had that. Uh, I have actually, I, interestingly, interestingly uh, uh, me being me, I have actually read that line, actually, but uh, it's because uh, uh, might, there might be an indication of that in my former comments, because I mentioned that exact figure earlier in my comments. I'm not afraid to be transparent or accountable for any of the delivery of these compensation schemes. Shaila Shwara. Thank you, Madam Speaker. May I congratulate my hon. Friend for all that he is doing, working night and day to bring this painful issue to a conclusion for the many postmasters and their families who have suffered so much over so many years. Uh, can I just mention, uh, seek the uh, assurance from the Minister that for those people who do not accept the fixed offer but wish to pursue an individual claim, that there will be expeditious treatment of those claims that resources will be made available to deal with those claims quickly and efficiently. And also, can I ask the Minister to give an assurance that the claimant will have a named individual who is responsible for their files, rather than whoever happens to pick up the file on a specific day? Uh, well, can I thank him for his question? And um, yes, absolutely, I can give him that assurance. A uh, fixed sum award is only one route. It's not right for everybody. Some people have high, higher levels of claims, and we will support them where we can. In my, my remarks, I announced some new measures we're doing that. Uh, do, uh, we're, we're using to do that, including a pilot scheme where it doesn't require expert reports, which should uh, significantly abbreviate the timescale for responding to offer, to be able to submit a claim and responding to the claim. Um, in terms of uh, expedition in this area, in the GLO scheme, for example, we set a target that 90% 90 90 of cases would respond to a uh, final claim within 40 days. We're hitting 87% currently on, against that measure, so we are delivering this more quickly. It makes an interesting point about a, a named claims manager or something along those lines. If I can, I'll take that away. Madam Deputy Speaker, I welcome the statement. I, I welcome the, the legislation and, the, and removing the post office from uh, the process as far as we have so far. But I don't think the post office is credible to be able to deal with any uh, claims. I wrote to the minister on the 12th of February regarding my constituent that came forward after the TV uh, uh, pr programme, and uh, she 
was in a situation where she had uh, problems with Horizon. She agreed a compensation with the post office, way below what her losses were. She signed a non-disclosure agreement, but at that time, she was dealing with a partner who was terminally ill, who has subsequently passed away. So she was in no fit state to be able to take on the post office, and she's it was seriously out of pocket. Now, in those circumstances, I would expect her to be able to, uh, to, to um, come under the HSS scheme, and I hope that uh, he will confirm that in the letter that no doubt he's going to send to me. Oh. Uh, well, I look forward to I haven't seen that letter yet. Um, I understand his points about the post office handling claims, um, uh, but well, I've responded to every single letter I get on this from colleagues personally, and um, <clears throat> so, um, as we always do, but even more so on this particular occasion. Um, so I'm very sorry to hear about his constituents and the situation they're in. Um, if his constituents has accepted less than £75,000, they'll get an automatic uplift to £75,000. So, if they receive less, um, but um, we're determined to make sure people across every single scheme are treated fairly and feel that they're being tre treated fairly. Very keen to look at his letter and make sure that is the case in his case. Virginia Crosby, you, Madam Deputy Speaker, may I welcome this important new bill? I know the minister and his team have worked exceptionally hard uh, on it. To